What we've seen from European data that is mirrored in the United States is that abortion pills are at least four times more dangerous than surgical abortions. The abortion debate continues. As potential court decisions about Roe versus Wade come into focus, attention turns to the dangers of pill-induced abortions. As John Paul said, as the family goes, so goes the society, because the very foundational structure and cell of society is the family. The former president of the Catholic Medical Association speaks out after a study shows American Catholic dioceses have work to do to support family leave policies for their own employees. In the room where it happens, we go to the Vatican to get a behind-the-scenes look at the selection of saints as the church proclaims new saints for the first time in two years. When you look at these pieces around us, you see a mother's love. Venerating our Blessed Mother at a museum believed to have the world's largest collection of Marian art. EWTN News In-Depth starts now. My concern with male order abortions is some young woman uh, will have significant, maybe fatal consequences because they are being given a lie that they should not be seeing a physician. The next frontier in the pro-life battle to save the unborn, chemically induced abortions. But first, this week, a demand by Senate Democrats for a vote to codify Roe versus Wade on Capitol Hill. As the 50-year-old ruling faces a likely Supreme Court reversal this summer, pro-abortion senators scramble to preserve it in a doomed vote on Wednesday night. The chamber blocked the Women's Health Protection Act of 2022 in a 51 to 49 vote, with Democrat Joe Manchin of West Virginia joining all 50 Republicans. Though Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer knew it would fail, he said he wanted every senator's abortion stance on the record before November's midterm elections. With a Senate so evenly split, Democrats appear to have no path towards passing a bill to cement federal abortion rights unless they scrap the filibuster. 60 votes are required now to pass legislation in the Senate. There aren't 60 votes there at the federal level, no matter who happens to be in the majority, no matter who happens to be in the White House. So I think the widespread sentiment of my conference is that this issue will be dealt with at the state level. But the vote seemed to galvanize the other side of the aisle. We have to take that anger that we're feeling, channel it into action to defend our majority. We have to elect more pro-choice senators. We're not living in a hypothetical. We are staring down a post-row world in the face, and I am here to say, we are here to say, we must act now. As national politicians figure out their next move, pro-life leaders are turning their attention beyond surgical procedures to medical abortions induced with pills. Reporter Mark Irons explains why this is so significant. The country awaits a Supreme Court ruling this summer that could significantly change the legal landscape of abortion in the U.S. and give states more power to regulate it. But beyond that headline, another major change is shifting the issue. The majority of abortions are no longer in-person surgical procedures. Estimates from the Guttmacher Institute show 54% of U.S. abortions now come from abortion pills. In some states, they can easily be ordered over the phone and sent through the mail. With cries of abortion pills forever, one recent publicity stunt on the Supreme Court steps involved abortion advocates consuming pills. Pro-life advocates are working to educate the public. What's usually described as the abortion pill is a chemical regimen of two different drugs. Katie Glenn, government affairs counsel with Americans United for Life, travels around the country speaking with lawmakers about the drugs mifepristone and misoprostol. The Food and Drug Administration has given approval for their use within 10 weeks of pregnancy. The pills are taken one after the other to chemically abort a developing unborn baby. As we're seeing, it's now over 50% of all abortions in the United States. In some European countries, it's up to 80% of all of their abortions. So we think that that trend is going to increase. And there's even more interest now, since a document was leaked from the U.S. Supreme Court last week suggesting Roe versus Wade could be overturned and abortion could be further restricted. We spoke with a D.C.-based telehealth practice that works with an abortion pill supplier called Aid Access. 
They tell us the day after the Supreme Court leak, visitors to the Aid Access website increased by more than 2,800 percent. We've been contacting abortion providers and there's no question demand for the abortion pill has greatly increased, including here at Planned Parenthood. On its website, Planned Parenthood, the nation's largest abortion provider, claims the abortion pill is a safe and effective way to end an early pregnancy. But Katie Glenn says even the FDA warns. You should expect to bleed for between 9 and 16 days. And she's pushing back on the Planned Parenthood claim. Studies in Europe of use of the drug show that complication rate can be between 1 in 20 women needing surgery and 1 in 5 women having any kind of complication. So that means bleeding longer, um, potentially needing a follow-up surgery. With the Biden administration-backed FDA green light, at this point states can't ban abortion pills. But in a state like South Dakota, a recently passed law enforces greater regulation. I think that every pro-lifer needs to be a part of this battle. Dale Barcher is the executive director of South Dakota Right to Life. He says a woman seeking chemical abortion in South Dakota will have to make three clinic visits, two separate in-person visits to receive the pills, and a third visit as a wellness checkup. We're simply narrowing the scope of the chemical abortion pill in the state of South Dakota. We're tightening it. A handful of other states are passing similar measures. Last week in Tennessee, Governor Bill Lee signed a bill making it a crime to send abortion pills through the mail. And Indiana wants to get more information to women. We require ultrasounds before you have an abortion so that the woman understands there's a baby there. Indiana State Senator Liz Brown tells me her state requires women who start the two-pill abortion process to be informed they can attempt to reverse it if they change their mind. You sign a consent form saying you understand what's going to happen and that you have a period of time from the first pill to the second pill that you're able to understand there's an option, it's not a guarantee, but to go and get the hormone that would reverse the process. And in states that have fewer restrictions, Katie Glenn is concerned teenagers could order the drugs without consent. There is a push to get these to kids, to get them away from their parents, for their parents not to know what's going on. The legal battle over abortion continues as the fight for life looks different than it has in decades past. Mark Irons, EWTN News in depth. There's a lot to unpack on this issue. Dr. Joseph Meany, president of the National Catholic Bioethics Center, joins us now to discuss. Dr. Meany, the series of medical pills that provokes an abortion, as Mark described in his package, has been available in the U.S. since 2000. How has this changed the abortion debate over time? Well, one of the things that it has done is changed how abortion is done in America. Increasingly, uh, the majority of abortions are being done through these pills as opposed to surgery. And that opens up a huge Pandora's box of all kinds of ethical and medical problems that are associated with it. And for doctors specifically, how has the abortion pill created new ethical concerns? Well, one of the things is that, you know, doctors perform procedures and they have a certain expertise and professionalism, et cetera. They're board certified, all these types of things. When it comes to the abortion pill, this is essentially self-medication. So people are taking it um, at home uh, without medical supervision. Uh, you know, telemedicine uh, is, is kind of uh, the way it's being sold, but actually people are having their abortions at home and you know, being rushed to the hospital in some circumstances, et cetera. It's, it's a completely different experience of abortion than the surgical abortions. And in terms of informed consent, the idea that people are actually aware of what they're doing. Correct. Yeah. So one of the things that is the basis of medical ethics is that you have to understand a procedure. You have to understand the risks and the benefits and, and make an informed choice. And what happens with abortion is that people don't make an informed choice. Uh, those abortion providers generally do not provide. And that's why actually states have passed so many laws requiring ultrasounds, requiring you know information to be given about other options, all these other things. But it kind of goes to the new level when you have these abortion pills, because some individuals you know skip the doctor 100% and they just get the abortion pill and take it. And they don't have any idea of the dangers and the risks and all the, all the possible things that can go wrong. So it it's raises major, major ethical concerns. Well, let's talk about those other options. Abortion pill reversal methods, ways to interrupt the abortion process are also being considered as important in part of this waiting period. Some states are trying to legislate that to give mothers a chance to change their minds. This began about a decade ago, right? Is this widely used and effective? 
So it is, it is used and effective. It's, it's actually been heavily attacked by the abortion industry and, uh, and abortion supporters, but the science of it seems very good that uh, if taken early enough, uh, one can reverse the effects because essentially what the abortion pill does is detaches uh, the child from nutrients. And so if you can reverse those hormonal effects, then you know, the pregnancy can go, go forward. But uh, many, many abortion advocates do not want that information to be available. And it does create another ethical situation, right? The woman has made the choice to have an abortion, uh, taken the pill, and then all of a sudden she, you know, reconsiders and wants to change her mind, a lot of the abortion side would say, no, it's too late. You can't change your mind anymore. You don't have any more choice. Uh, the pro-lifers are saying, you still have a choice. There's still medical options for you to reverse that abortion. And of course, ethically, uh, one should be offering people uh, good moral choices. We have all kinds of heroic methods to save the, uh, a life outside of the womb. Why wouldn't we have heroic, heroic methods within the womb, right? Um, is that... Right. Is that part of the framing for it, this idea that you have to have other options at all moments? I think so. I mean, we're, we're obviously free. As human beings, we have free will. We can, we can make bad decisions and good ones. But the point is we should have informed consent and we should have as many options as possible that are good options. Now, if, if something is a really bad option, such as having an abortion, um, it's, it's actually good for the law to prohibit that. And, and you know, I think that the, the abortion pills should be illegal in any, any state that has no legal surgical abortions, it's, an abortion is an abortion, whether it's a surgery or a pill. And the language about abortions matters here. The Washington Post and others have complained about the term pro-life, but this matters even more so in the context of medical associations and just the medical practice. How has language around life changed for doctors or been threatened to change when it comes to abortion? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I find most terrible is you know the side that backs abortion calls itself pro-choice. The side that backs life calls itself pro-life. But then you know there are all these different uh, different ways that that gets permutated, right? So they, they refer to pro-lifers as anti-choice. Uh, the those who are favoring abortion, you know, as pro-abortion, etc. In the medical profession, you know, frequently they don't even use the term abortion. They say termination, termination of pregnancy. Now, technically speaking. Uh, a delivery is a termination of pregnancy, right? The pregnancy ends, <laughs> but but there's there's no moral fault there. Whereas when you're intentionally killing a child through through a procured abortion, you are killing, and and that goes against medical ethics in in the traditional sense of Hippocratic medicine, which mentions abortion specifically. So I mean, the rhetoric has changed a lot over time, but I think the emphasis on choice. And just saying that one is pro-choice is, is insufficient. You have to say pro-choice about what? what? What are the choices that you're in favor of? Well, let's talk about some of those choices just because there's such a variety of exceptions in some of these laws. It can be overwhelming for Catholics. How should they evaluate considerations like rape and the life of the mother, especially around this medical abortion debate? Yeah, so I mean, the, the one consideration where Catholics have, you know, a, a real education that needs to be done is when it comes to the life of the mother. So you can never do a, a direct abortion, right? We can never kill someone to save another person. However, you know, using the principle of double effect, one can justify treatments to save one patient uh, that could have a deleterious effect on another patient. Uh, and, and both of our patients, the mother and the child. But in some circumstances, it, it's impossible to save either the mother or the child. In some circumstances, it's impossible to save the life of the child. Uh, and one has to do everything one can do to save both, right? But, so the, the key point is that abortion is never necessary. A direct abortion is never necessary to, to save the life of the mother. Uh, what could be necessary is, is a procedure you know, to treat her cancer, um, even maybe a hysterectomy, something of that nature, that would directly attack, you know, what is the problem, the, the health problem, and, and the unintended but foreseen consequences the child might die from that. But that is different from a direct abortion. The church has made a, a strong distinction there. Do you think that this moment we're living right now is an opportunity for the Catholic Church? Absolutely. I mean, the church has been standing for life so strongly right, since Roe v. Wade. And now that is coming, coming to fruition, right? Society is moving in our direction. And I think the church should be congratulated. The church is certainly being attacked for, for having stood up so, so valiantly for life. But this culture of life that St. John Paul II spoke about is really coming to bloom in the United States. And that's, that's a beautiful thing to see. And it, it can't stop. It has to continue, uh, go beyond abortion to so many other issues that are life issues. 
Well, Dr. Meany, you've given us a lot of food for thought, both in how we need to inform ourselves, the way that we can manage these considerations, and how to be hopeful for the future. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. The conversation continues next. When women do become mothers, what support does society provide for them? In some cases, even the Catholic Church as an employer is not as supportive as it could be. EWTN News In-Depth will be right back. We've been taught to be like Mary, and I, I believe that we should be given that same respect. An employee of a Catholic archdiocese seeks family support after the birth of a child. What happened after her request, and what's happening at other dioceses around the country? That report, next. Look at the gentleness of this mother's face. She's absolutely beautiful. And later, as we celebrate the month of Mary, we go on a tour of a massive art collection dedicated to Our Lady, Our Blessed Mother. We know the church is pro-life, pro-family, and so we wanted to understand what, what is the state of maternity leave in the church today. The state of maternity leave. Within a faith community working to defend life and strengthen the family, the practical reality is often unsatisfactory. That's what one young woman who worked for the Archdiocese of Washington found out when she inquired about potential benefits during her maternity leave. As the landscape of abortion laws change across the country, there's a renewed focus on support for families and a deeper look at what the Catholic Church provides for its own employees. Here's reporter Rizal Reyes. Meet Christine John, a mother of two. Like a lot of mothers in America, she faced a difficult choice after giving birth to a newborn baby, stay home or go back to work. I was pregnant and looking to see what my options were for maternity leave. Um, there weren't any. It was all just uh, FMLA, which obviously does not, it just uh, uh, guarantees your job and does not give you any pay and short-term disability. The Family Medical Leave Act of 1993 is a labor law that allows eligible employees of covered employers to take job-protected, unpaid 12 weeks of leave. Christine qualified for short-term disability, but the policy would only provide 60 percent of her pay, which she says wasn't enough to cover expenses with a new baby. Christine, who worked at the Archdiocese of Washington's Pastoral Center in Maryland at the time, was appalled at the options provided to her. It's so stressful, especially as a new mother, to think about what you're going to do in those, like, you know, I have to go back to work in, what, two weeks, four weeks, and I have this newborn, and you have to figure out what it's like to be a mother and how to be okay with your body and your mental state. Christine advocated for paid maternity leave in the Archdiocese of Washington. Today, the Archdiocese of Washington offers eight weeks of paid maternity and paternity leave. According to an extensive report in March on the status of maternity leave in the U.S. Catholic Church, the Archdiocese of Washington is just one of a few dioceses that offer any paid leave. This report was published by the media company Femme Catholic, which was founded by Samantha Pavlock, who seeks to educate, encourage, and empower Catholic women by covering stories that affect them. We know that the church does support families and is very pro-life, and so what are the policies? What is going on on the ground? And we wanted to investigate. Femme Catholic reached out to 176 dioceses across all 50 states, including Washington, D.C. Not every diocese responded. From those which did, the results were startling. Only 31 dioceses offer fully paid maternity leave. 32 provide some percentage of employee salaries through state paid leave laws or short-term disability and 44 do not offer any paid leave. Based on the findings, there was little correlation between the financial status of each diocese and how many days of paid leave was provided for employees. Some dioceses only offer a few days of leave, while the most generous dioceses offer leave up to 12 weeks. From a medical standpoint, OBGYN Dr. Lester Rupersberger says women need at least six weeks postpartum to recover. I've seen patients in my office six weeks postpartum that are still exhausted, still have to get up in the middle of the night, still not back to normal, not completely healed. Dr. Rupersberger, a former president of the Catholic Medical Association, says providing paid family leave brings so many benefits to the family as a whole. 
He says this is an opportunity for the Catholic Church to evangelize and show how they value family. If they want to recognize parenthood and motherhood and fatherhood and the benefit of the family using the Holy Family as a model, then they should definitely be in the leadership role of providing this up front. That was the goal of the Diocese of Raleigh, North Carolina, to be on the forefront of providing its employees with more than just the necessary benefits. In 2018, using the FMLA as its framework, the diocese began offering 12 weeks of paid family leave for all employees. Why not try to implement something that is above and beyond what we have to do. It is, it's from an employment standpoint, it's a, it's a good attractor. It, it is good for retention. It, and from a social justice standpoint, it just is the right thing to do. The Diocese of Raleigh is arguably the most charitable in the country in providing paid family leave. Its policy applies to all eligible diocesan employees across schools, parishes, and agencies. Fem Catholics report says many dioceses lack paid leave for a variety of reasons, ranging from no legal requirement to small staff. House explains that providing this benefit is financially feasible. Look at what is currently being done. Look at the amount of leave that's already being taken and see if there's any middle ground that could be found to, to allow your employees to take even a little bit more paid leave so that they don't have to choose between caring for their family and their job. In an effort to raise more awareness for the need for paid maternity leave, Fem Catholic CEO Samantha Pavlock also spearheaded a paid leave petition. We are asking them to take a careful look at all the information we've compiled, all the data, all the church teachings and things that various popes have said over the years, and to really take it to prayer and consider uh, consider this issue. Christine sends a message to other Catholic mothers. We're, we're taught as young women and as little children to um, idolize Mary and to be more like Mary. We should be the mother that we have been called to be and also know that, that we are worthy of, of everything. So we, we deserve that support. Hopefully we turn this around. Hopefully that, you know, we may not do it for ourselves, but we might do it for our daughters. Rosel Rages, EWTN, News in Depth. Femme Catholic and key partners are working to raise this conversation with the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. If you would like to look up whether your diocese offers family leave to its employees, you can go to the article at femcatholic.com post paid leave report. And remember, of the 176 dioceses surveyed, 70 chose not to respond. We turn now to a leading voice on family leave, Adrienne Schwier. She's a fellow at the Bipartisan Policy Center where she leads its paid family leave task force. Adrienne, it's great to have you here. Tell us about what the biggest sticking points have been in the family leave discussions for both sides, Democrats and Republicans. Any overlap? That's such a great question. The, the, the best answer to it is that there's a lot of areas of agreement, both Republicans and Democrats from across the country, from across ideological spectrum, seem to really agree on the idea that new moms and new dads who are giving birth or adopting and sometimes even fostering a new baby should have a robust paid family leave benefit. Where they get into areas of disagreement is expanding that to cover family caregivers, those caring for a loved one who might be going through chemo or who is in, you know, who got hit by a car or self-care. We call it medical leave to care for yourself if one of those tragic things happens to you and has to take you away from work. But really where they get into areas of disagreement is how you pay for it, which is always a question when you're talking about some type of program that has a cost associated um, and what the uh, structure looks like of that benefit. But I think it's remarkable that in the time I've been working on this issue, you know, six years ago, there were almost no Republicans talking about it at all. Then candidate Trump had one policy platform in his presidential campaign, and it was around paid maternity leave. Um, and since that time, a lot of Republicans have started to work on this issue and are thinking about new solutions and trying to work across the aisle with Democrats. It won't surprise you that this last year, it's been hard to find bipartisan collaboration on these issues that have been often tied up in um, the Build Back Better program that Democrats were pushing through reconciliation. But I am very hopeful that in light of all of the um, data that we're experiencing on families and hardships 
today that we'll see more bipartisan collaboration around this issue, especially since there's so much agreement around parental leave. And it might not be a conversation that was being had on the Hill, but it's definitely one that faith communities have been a part of. Do you find that they're willing partners and leaders in this debate? A hundred percent. And that way before the leak from the Supreme Court with the decision coming down um, right now, way before that, we saw the faith community really align as paid family leave is really a pro-family issue. And I'll give you a couple of the reasons. I mean, if a mother has time with her baby at the beginning of life, she is much more likely to have a strong breastfeeding connection and to have time to recover and enter those like beautiful weeks where the baby can smile back at you and is sleeping a little bit. Um, you have a healthier postpartum experience, less likely to have things like um, post postpartum depression. It's really a, 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 an important part of maternal health and mom and baby well-being, but also around dads. This is my favorite thing that a lot of the faith community has really rallied around. When a dad is present for the birth of his child, his body releases a hormone called oxytocin. It's like a love potion that makes him fall more in love with his partner and with his baby. And that family connectivity, that mom and dad, like really bonding alongside that baby in those first days, weeks of life creates a much stronger family fabric. And that's where we've seen a lot of the faith community rally around the necessity for protecting this time. As many of you know, um, one in four moms in America, this is all pre-pandemic, so I'm sure it's worse, was going back to work within seven or 10 to 14 days of giving birth. That is catastrophic. One in four women going back to work within 10 to 14 days of giving birth is really terrifying. They're not their whole selves. They're often nurses and teachers, um, not returning to behind the desk jobs, returning to hard jobs. And I think that has what's brought that, those types of data points are what have brought the faith community really around. It's an important factor, especially now, as you mentioned, bringing up the abortion decision that's coming up. Do you think that that reality, the fact that abortion was legal in this country, is legal in this country, has blocked the development of better policies for women in the workplace, since it's assumed that abortion is a mainstream option for unexpected pregnancies? I, that, I don't think so. I don't think that it has been a Roe Wade catalyst that has helped things. I don't think that has been the obstruction. I think it has been the willingness to work across the aisle and compromise. And we just haven't seen compromise on this issue. We have great champions, great pro-family conservative champions, Marco Rubio, Mitt Romney, Mike Lee, Joni Ernst, uh, Bill Cassidy from the Senate, all of these really strong conservatives that want to work on paid leave. And they've struggled to find Democratic dance partners that are willing to kind of think outside the box or outside of the you know one or two policies that Democrats have really rallied around. So I don't think it's a derivative of the abortion debate. I do believe that both sides know that new babies and new moms need to be cared for and need policies of support and that paid parental leave and paid family leave really fit that uh, box. I just don't think they've been motivated to collaborate. Adrian, let's move this into the corporate America world. We're seeing companies like Microsoft and Tesla offer to pay for the cost and travel of an abortion. Are companies reacting to providing paid leave benefits as well? So that is a great question. About five or six years ago, we saw a really robust transition across the corporate community to offer bigger and better paid rental and fits. Some companies giving up to a year, some going six months, some going 12 weeks full paid. We were seeing all kinds of other supplements to help new parents um, stay connected to the workforce. But over the last week or two with this, um, with the leak from the Supreme Court, you have not seen companies come out and make new announcements about how they're gonna expand parental leave to support their workers. Um, and many, the, the biggest problem there is that a lot of the big companies already offer some form of paid leave to their white collar headquarter workers. Some even offer it like Walmart down to their um, hourly workers, but you're not seeing a lot of those benefits go to the lower wage workers, the hourly workers across the country who often need it most to make their paychecks and are the ones returning to work 10, 14 days after giving birth. That's definitely difficult. Who are the leaders then? You have Chuck Schumer who reacted to the leaked draft of the Supreme Court decision with a call for passage of the Women's Health Protection Act codifying abortion. Are there efforts like this draft legislation at any stage for paid leave? Paid leave has seen quite a stagnant situation. 
it, it hasn't seen robust proposals that are new and bold and getting ideas to the table in the last couple of weeks. And you certainly haven't seen the momentum that you just mentioned that Schumer brought to the floor on the abortion issue transcend its way into baby. That should change. It needs to change. It's going to require people across both sides of the political spectrum to, to demand that change. And it's one of the it's one of the things that I think is hardest because in some ways we're spending time in the Senate working on pieces of legislation that we know are going to fail when we know that there's bipartisanship and probably 60 votes to pass a meaningful paid leave mm -hmm. program. We just need people to work on those ideas. I will flag for you, there is one proposal coming up that I'm pretty excited about um, that protects pregnant workers. Um, it really helps prevent against discrimination at work against a pregnant woman and also um, encourages reasonable accommodation, you know, and being able to take a water bottle to your manufacturing line, an extra bathroom break, the kinds of things that really give you a health, a chance at a healthy pregnancy, supported by groups like the March of Dimes and the Catholic Bishops and the Chamber of Commerce, because it's very pro-business, very pro-family. And I'm very hopeful that that bill, at the least, it's not paid leave, but at least is better protecting working women who are pregnant, will come to the floor in the very near future. Well, that's something to be hopeful for, and we'll be looking out for any new proposals. Thank you so much, Adrian. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. There's so much more ahead. Next, to Rome for an important weekend for the Catholic Church. But who is making you do this? Why are you doing this? Is it worth it? Discussing the difficult life of one man on the path to sainthood. As 10 new saints are canonized this weekend at the Vatican, we talk to the cardinal in charge of the process about the life choices those saints made that can inspire us all today. New saints in the kingdom. This weekend, Pope Francis canonizes 10 people as new saints in our church. EWTN Rome Bureau Chief Andrea Tonhauser gives us a look behind the scenes of how the canonization process works and tells us what these 10 new saints all have in common. At the end of life, we will not be asked if we have been believers, but if we have been credible, that is, if we have been true witnesses. Saints are role models. Their lives are not only inspiring, but are also blueprints to real happiness and ultimately eternal life. Currently, there are more than 10,000 people recognized as saints in the Catholic Church. This weekend, famous people such as Charles de Foucault and little known ones like Lazzaro de Vasayam Pillai from Tamil Nadu in India are elevated into the status of sainthood. The lives and backgrounds from the 10 different saints are very diverse. One thing they do have in common, however, is their zeal for evangelization, a topic close to Pope Francis's heart. We're here at the Congregation for the Causes of Saints with Cardinal Marcello Semeraro, who is the prefect of this congregation and has sat down with us to talk about the process for how to become a saint, but also what the lives of the saints could mean for us today. Many blessed individuals who will be canonized in May have lived quite recently, in the 19th and 20th century. One of them is Charles de Foucault, who has the so-called fame of holiness. But the signs of holiness are different from popularity. Some saints are really not attractive to the public eye at all. Father de Foucault is also a figure who sought hiding, not popularity. He was a convert, became a priest, and followed Christ by being with the most humble, the most forgotten. His space was not the big city, but the desert. But yet he is called the universal brother, as he became a brother to all, a brother imitating Christ. Cardinal Zamoraro is convinced that the saints in general are important role models for our times. Their voices should be heard today. That is true of the other nine blessed to be canonized alongside Charles de Foucault. There are four women and six men. Every new saint has led a different, yet inspiring life. Most founded their own religious community, which is still active until this day. 
the Cardinal showed us also the room where matters of potential sainthood are being discussed and explained the process. The process of sainthood starts in the local church, which perceives the saint, discerns the reputation of holiness. We had in the Middle Ages a proverb, vox populi, vox dei, the voice of the people, the voice of God. We need a lot of caution when we apply it. Sometimes there is a vox populi, but it is not the vox dei. It is not the voice of God. We have the task of examining. It is a word that also Pope Francis, as a Jesuit, frequently uses. Discerning means separating the good from the bad, collecting what is best, reviewing it. And this is the task of the congregation. And once this discernment is done, all the material is examined on three levels. The first level is that of historians and theologians. The second level, if this is exceeded, is that of members, bishops, and cardinals who examine in one of their meetings the material. Then they submit their findings to the judgment of the Pope. After these examinations on different levels, the waiting period starts. Cardinal Semeraro refers to it as waiting for the finger of God. The one thing that is needed to seal a cause for sainthood is a miracle, unless the soon-to-be saint was a martyr. Now we are waiting for some signal, which tells us, you have judged well. And this, in the ordinarius of cases, is the miracle. There is a situation, a circumstance, in which the miracle is not required, at least at a first level, and it is martyrdom, because martyrdom is the first form of holiness, and the one the Church has recognized. Pope Francis seems to have a real heart for true witnesses as he created 909 new saints in only nine years. Their stories are fascinating and inspire the faithful to lead themselves a life well lived and holy. For EWTN News In Depth, Andreas Turnhauser. EWTN News In Depth reported just last week on the six African-American men and women who are on the path toward sainthood. You can take a look at their lives on our social media pages and pray for their path towards canonization. Important headlines are next in the Week in Review. A new front in Ukrainian efforts to push back against Russia tops the week in review. Part of the battle has shifted to the courtroom. On Friday, the first war crimes trial of the conflict opened in Kyiv. A 21-year-old captured Russian soldier is accused of shooting an unarmed Ukrainian man in the head as he was riding his bicycle. The murder occurred during the war's first week. It's the first of what is expected to be many war crime trials. An effort by Congress to infuse $40 billion in additional aid to Ukraine hit a roadblock on Thursday. In a rare show of bipartisan support, Democrats and Republicans in both the House and Senate are trying to approve the money to make sure weapons shipments to Ukraine are not interrupted. But Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky stalled a fast-track vote demanding a federal watchdog oversee the money. The delay in approving the funds drew bipartisan criticism as the Defense Department says quick delivery of military assistance to Ukraine is critical to the battle right now. As Congress met on Ukraine, the situation there was also being discussed at the United Nations, where members assessed the humanitarian toll on the country. Almost 14 million Ukrainians have been forced to flee their homes, of whom 8 million are internally displaced. 227 partners, the majority national NGOs, have provided humanitarian assistance to over 5.4 million people, many of those in the East. This scale-up is unprecedented. And a show of military support for all of Eastern Europe right now in North Macedonia, NATO's newest member. U.S. troops join soldiers from 18 other nations conducting military exercises called Operation Swift Response. And in direct military assistance to Ukraine, 60 Ukrainians began training this week in Germany on the powerful howitzer artillery system, versions of which are being sent to Ukraine by both the U.S. and Germany. And a sign of growing NATO strength. On Thursday, Finland's leaders announced they are in favor of a rapid application for NATO membership without delay. 
Finland shares an 800-mile border with Russia, a neutral country since World War II. It has generally had cordial relations with Russia. But the Finnish president says Vladimir Putin's aggression against Ukraine has turned the Finnish public against Russia. The Russian government reacted quickly to the announcement, saying the move threatens its security. Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos Jr. will become the next president of the Philippines, a country that is more than 85 percent Catholic. He won in a landslide victory. Marcos is the son of former dictator Ferdinand Marcos Sr., who was ousted in the late 80s after an uprising supported by Filipino Catholic leaders. Before the election, the clergy for moral choice officially endorsed his opposition, current Vice President Lenny Robredo. The group, composed of more than 1,000 Catholic bishops, priests and deacons, encouraged their fellow Filipinos to vote for true servant leaders, whose hearts are really after the heart of the Good Shepherd, like Lenny. Marcos's win is a stunning reversal of the people power pro-democracy revolt that ousted his father. An alarming development in Hong Kong where authorities arrested retired Cardinal Joseph Zen, citing, quote, collusion with foreign forces. Zen has since been released on bail. The 90-year-old cardinal, a former bishop of Hong Kong and outspoken critic of China's Communist Party, was detained on Wednesday. Cardinal Zen is believed to have been arrested because of his role as trustee of the now-defunct 612 Humanitarian Relief Fund, which provided financial support to pro-democracy protesters. The arrest sparks worry about a more intense crackdown on religious freedom in Hong Kong. In a statement released Wednesday, the Vatican expressed concern over Zen's arrest and said it's watching the situation closely. President Biden has met with the parents of abducted journalist Austin Tice, giving them new hope their son will safely return home after almost 10 years in captivity in Syria. EWTN News has covered the Tice case for several years now. The American journalist was abducted in 2012 while reporting on the Syrian civil war. The family has been restless in pursuing Austin's release, but progress in communicating with the Syrian government has been slow. In their meeting, President Biden encouraged the parents, saying he will engage directly with the Assad regime to bring Austin home. While the Tices say Biden's promise of action filled them with renewed vigor, Mark Tice told EWTN in 2018 that his family's Catholic faith has been fueling their efforts for almost a decade. Faith and prayers are what keeps us from staying in bed all day. Uh, and not only our own, but knowing that there are, you know, we believe thousands and thousands, if not millions of people out there praying for us, praying for Austin. And we feel that. We also believe Austin feels that. Uh, so it's critically important uh, to, to keep us going. And we believe to keep Austin strong as well. The family published a letter to President Biden in October, asking for his personal engagement in Austin's case. They're anxious to see the president's words put to action to bring him home. In Chile, a religious freedom case involving the right of the Catholic Church to decide who teaches its beliefs was lost at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. This is a story we first reported on last year. The case, Sandra Pavez, a religion teacher at a government school in San Bernardo, lost her certification to teach the Catholic faith in her school when the diocese revoked it after she disclosed she was in a same-sex relationship. The school retained Pavez as a teacher of other subject matters, but she sued the diocese. She lost her case in a Chilean court and then went to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which sided with her. Listen, if the Catholic Church, which is a free entity in a country that respects freedom of religion, considers that that person is not in the capacity of transmitting the Catholic faith, that is not something that someone can change by procuring a reaction from the state. Because is without that, that, uh, that freedom, it... The, the one that will determine what is taught to the children and youth of one country is going to be the, more power, the most powerful. The executive director of EWTN News Catholic News Agency says most countries in Latin America have laws that prevent putting LGBTQ rights over religious freedom. But they're facing growing pressure from the European Union, United Nations and even the U.S. that could impact religious liberty. We've been fortunate to have our colleague Alejandro Bermudez's insights for more than 25 years at EWTN. 
During that time, Alejandro has been instrumental in expanding EWTN's outreach to the Spanish-speaking world, helping to create bureaus throughout Latin America. He was part of ASI Prensa and, his, and its sister agencies since the early days and is the founder of the Catholic News Agency. Alejandro's contributions to EWTN have been immense. Now, as he retires, we asked him, in his quarter century covering the Catholic Church in Latin America, what concerns him and what gives him hope? What concerns me the most is the how secularization, not even not even ev evangelicals, but secularization, is starting to dominate our countries and our culture, killing much of the Catholic root. That's my main concern. And my main hope is to see that as a consequence of that, just as Pope Benedict XVI predicted, there are a group of very serious committed Catholics that are becoming a creative minority that can be bring, that is bringing and can bring great religious and social transformation to uh, the whole region. And I'm very hopeful to be a little part of that. All of us here at EWTN wish Alejandro the very best as he moves on to the next chapter of his life and apostolic work, knowing that his work here touched millions of Catholics around the globe. She was a human mother raising a human Jesus. When we return, a joyous visit to Philadelphia for an art lesson filled with a mother's love. A one-of-a-kind museum in Philadelphia, shown only by appointment, claims to have the largest collection of Marian artwork in the world. As we honor the Blessed Mother Mary during the month of May, the doors open for our own private tour. Here's EWTN News In-Depth reporter Colm Flynn. I have seen people come into this art museum and pick a piece and study it, and they will fill up with tears something emotionally touches them about that one piece of art. It is an incredible collection of religious art. Over 400 pieces, all with one thing in common. They are all depicting Our Lady at different stages of her life. Get to know Our Lady, but get to know Our Lady in the way that you would as a young girl, as a young mother, and then as a sorrowful mother. And each piece of art in here, which is only Mary and her son, tells that story and tells that story of our faith. It's, it's just unbelievable. And it touches people, for sure it touches people. This is believed to be the largest Marian art collection in the world, which is part of the Miraculous Medal Shrine in the neighborhood of Germantown in Philadelphia. Look at the gentleness of this mother's face. She's absolutely beautiful. Mary Jo Timlin Hoag is the Chief Executive Officer. Every age that we have in here, which starts from the 13th century to current time, you see Mary evolve. And she evolves because of the time and the way that people thought of Mary and their faith at the time, but more importantly, the way the artists that depict each one of these pieces thought of Mary. We've got oil on um, canvas, we've got gilding on wood, we've got textile prints, we've got marble, we've got carvings, we've got ceramics. He didn't turn any Mary away. The he Mary is referring to is Father Skelly's. He was the founder and driving force behind what's known as the Central Association of the Miraculous Medal, of which this collection is a part. This is his art museum. This is his Marian art museum. And Father Skelly's hope was that he would collect these pieces throughout his career in the hope that one day he could display them to the public so the public could get to know Our Lady and get to know and love Our Lady as she is seen through the ages. As the pieces come from all over the world, they also challenge the viewer's perception of Mary. Every artist has a culture and they depict Mary in the way that their culture shows it. And so we're gonna see some Chinese Marys and we'll see some Indian Marys and we have Spanish Marys that are a darker toned skin. And then of course you've got those that come from Italy and Europe and whatnot that are more pale skin. The oldest piece in the collection is from the 13th century. 
take a look at Our Lady's face. She's a little sterner. She's looking yeah. more serious than yeah. Our Lady would normally look. Exactly. And Mary Jo, do we know why she's looking more stern? Was that just how mothers were perceived at that time? I think this was the time period. This was the artist's interpretation of it for the time period. I also think that mothers may have been perceived that way, but it could have been during that time period in the church. That's how they presented Our Lady as well. What is incredible about this collection is how up close visitors can get to the art. Seeing the beauty of Mary, her tenderness and love towards her son, and then also the pain and sorrow at his death. You can see that she's older mm -hmm. and absolute sorrow there. And she's looking up to the angels and there's that darkness. She's looking up to God. You see her son is not in her arms. For Mary Jo, working with this collection has given her a deeper understanding of her faith. Why is it so important, do you think, for the church to have religious art and iconography like this, depicting, let's say, Our Lady? What can it communicate that the written word could never? Art is a universal language and words sometimes aren't always understood, depending on education level and cultural component. I always knew that Mary loved her son. That's evident in the Bible. It's evident in the way that she spoke about her son and asked her son to do things. There was absolute reverence for her son. But when you look at these pieces around us, you see a mother's love. And so I see the human side of Mary and the spiritual and the glorious side of Mary. For me, that mother's love and that human side is so impactful. And hopefully we will get people to love Our Lady the way we love Our Lady through the art that we present here. In Philadelphia, Colm Flynn, EWTN News in depth. Another celebration of the Blessed Virgin Mary, this one last weekend in Washington, D.C., where Asian and Pacific Island Catholics held a unique cultural pilgrimage. That's the subject of this week's Images of the Week. beautiful celebration, especially the children participating, you know, and uh, together is and the music, the song, and all the prayers. It's so touching, especially the, the Ave Maria. Catholic Asians and Pacific Islanders came from around the nation, communities from China, India, Vietnam, the Philippines, and Laos. To name a few, venerated Mother Mary. The event started with a call to prayer followed by a procession, a unique praying of the rosary spoken in different languages, and ended with a holy mass. Next week, we'll bring you many more voices from this event as we explore how these cultures incorporate Marian celebrations into their Catholic life. We hope you'll join us next week for that report and so much more important to your Catholic life. I'm Monse Alvarado. We'll see you then.